any audio now? Oh, can y'all hear us? All right. Well, there we go. We're back. Okay. We were having some audio issues. All right, guys. Sorry. We were having a few audio issues there. It looks like everything's working well now. So, Kurt just talked for a few minutes and nobody heard any of it. But um, anyway, I'll, I'll go ahead and jump in and give his voice a break for a second. Kurt was explaining. Um, we were kind of week to week as we find out what we're allowed to do, what the government's saying we can do um, as far as congregating and coming back together, but also uh, the virus, the things that are going on, it just kind of keeps ramping up. We've got more and more cases in the county. Um, and so basically what he had just explained was as of right now, we're looking at next week, we're going to go ahead and meet Facebook Live again next week. Uh, we plan to just go ahead and do that um, as usual and or as we have been the last couple of weeks and then um you know we'll be week to week after that we'll update you guys as soon as we know um but we do kind of we do want to be good citizens we want to be good stewards of of what god's given us as well um as far as our people and so we don't want to put any of you guys in harm's way or in any danger and um so for right now we do plan for next week to go ahead and meet facebook live like we have been um, we're doing all this on new software. This is new for all of us in this room. So we do have a few glitches we're still working out and we're trying to get better at it. Uh, so real quick, a couple of other announcements. Um, we do want to say this. We've had a lot of people ask about prayer requests. What do we do with those? Uh, we want to go ahead and we want to be able to receive your prayer requests. We're trying to work on a way to get a list together that our people can see, but our people only. Um, if you put them in the comments on this Facebook live video, if this gets shared, anybody who sees the live video will see uh, that comment. So we would rather you not do that. If you would like to message those directly to the church page, uh, you're welcome to do that. Or if you want to direct message Logan, Kurt, or myself through Facebook, um, we'll be glad to get those and not only go ahead and be praying for those, but also uh, to try to find a way we can add those to a list and get them on our web page. Uh, with that said, on our web page, you can find a couple different things. Um, you'll see that first picture that pops up that says Give Online. Uh, we had great online giving last week. Uh, we thank you all for that so much. We had a lot of you guys gave um, you know, by sending something in the mail. We appreciate that as well. That's absolutely awesome. We thank you all very much uh, for doing so. I know times are tough. Times are different. They are concerning, uh, but it is still our responsibility to take care of uh, things here around the church, and so we thank you guys for that. And um, if you want to give online this week, you go to our webpage, www.langdonstreet.org, and there you'll find that first picture says Give Online. You click on that. It takes you straight to that, um, that page where you can donate. Uh, but also, um, we also have on there for anyone who doesn't have Facebook. If you know someone who doesn't have Facebook and they're missing out on this video this morning, let me tell you what you can do. Pick up the phone and give them a call and tell them to go to www.langdonstreet.org. The second picture in the slideshow that comes across says join us live, and if they click on that picture, it'll take them directly to our Facebook page where they can click on this video and watch it, even if they don't have a Facebook account. So be sure to do that. Let them know they can do it from a smartphone, a computer, a tablet, whatever they got that can connect to the Internet and has a web browser. They can do it that way and find, uh, find our our Facebook Live video without even having Facebook. It's an awesome feature that they've added in. Um, hopefully they're going to add in a feature soon where people can just call like a 1-800 number and listen to the sermon on their phone. I've been hearing some rumors about that. So I'm going to try and let you guys know. Uh, I'm keeping my ear to the ground trying to keep up with all these updates that Facebook is doing. So I'll let you guys know as things change. Uh, really quick, just a couple of... Um, I'll mention one prayer request, then I'll let Brother Kurt mention another. Um, we've we've got a couple of uh, a couple of families we know that are really struggling right now uh, through some tough times. We know this coronavirus is is a scary thing, and a missionary friend of ours, he's been to our church before. He's shared here at our church. His name's Danny Jones, a missionary to Thailand. He also uh, does a lot. What's the name of that church in Florida? Do you remember the name of the church he's part of? 
Westwood. Westwood, Westwood Baptist mm-hmm. Church in in Florida. Um, down there, he does a lot with their school. They have a school similar to the one here that uh, teaches a lot of things and uh, biblical uh, things, theological things. And and Danny has a lot of involvement there. And so uh, Danny has actually uh, contracted the coronavirus. Um, he came home from a mission trip to Israel. And once he got home, he started to show some symptoms. And um, the entire family has actually ended up with it, as far as I know. And Danny is currently hospitalized because his condition has gotten pretty serious. Uh, so remember Danny Jones and his family in your prayers. Um, I know it's a tough time. They have three daughters. Uh, and, and like I said, they all, as far as I know, have it, but Danny is the one who's in very serious condition. So please, please remember Danny Jones in your prayers. I'll share one more really quick. Um, we heard some reports last, last night that, uh, a family that many of us have been connected to for a lot of years, uh, David and Sherry Spears were in a bad accident, a motorcycle accident. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of details, but what I can tell you is that they were airlifted. Um, they are in a hospital in Lexington and, uh, they're being treated there. Uh, I don't know a lot about their condition, so I'm not going to try to speculate and share a lot there. What I'm going to say is let's take some time and pray for them. I know last night when I found out, I tried to call and message their son-in-law and talk to him a little bit, but obviously he didn't answer. He had a lot going on, but we just told him, Hey, we're going to stop right now. We're going to say prayer or I'm going to say prayer for, for you and your family. And, um, so I did that, but we need to be sure to be taking some time in prayer for these two very serious situations. Um, and then Brother Kurt, where he's he's been at before in his town, had had some issues going on. I'll let Kurt share that really quick. Yes, um, this cup here is a, this is where I went to college at and also where I pastored at Arkansas State University is where I went to college in Jonesboro, Arkansas, where I pastored for seven years. Um, they were hit with a tornado, a pretty bad tornado. Um, the Lord was taking care of them uh, because of the coronavirus that was going on. Most of the stores in the mall that was hit were either shut down or they just had a very minimum uh, crew that they had there. And so it could have been a very bad situation, but a tornado hit right in the middle of the, the, the most busy part of town there. And, and, uh, but there was no fatalities that I know of right now. And all I've even seen is like just very few injuries uh, but they're still working. They've still got power out. There's just debris and power lines everywhere. So if you'll be in prayer for the people of Jonesboro, Arkansas, I would appreciate it. I've got a lot of people that I love there, um, family there, uh, folks that I pastored, and just uh, you know, uh, it's just it's it's it was home for me for uh, about nine years there. Uh, so I just want to be in prayer for the uh, for the. The people there, not only Jonesboro, but it, and there were some other towns and places along the way that it hit, but Jonesboro was the biggest. Um, so we're going to just have a time of prayer to start up. And like Dustin said, if you'd like to, a prayer request, um, just send it to us either on Facebook or text message or call the office and leave a message. Uh, Anissa will be, in, unless something happens, Anissa and myself will be here um, Monday through Thursday uh, we're from 9 to 3 and so we'll we'll take prayer requests and, and we'll be praying for these folks but right now we'll, we'll go to the Lord in prayer before we go into the message <clears throat> Lord we just come to you at this time Lord and Lord we just um, we first of all Lord we thank you for this opportunity that even though we're having to be um, separated to help be good citizens and be um, hope, hopefully stopping the spread of this uh, virus, Lord. We, we thank you that we can come in this, in this form where we can still hear your word, we can still share with each other, we can still <clears throat> um, uh, see that people are watching and communicate with them over the phone and over the uh, Facebook and different manners that we have, Lord. And Lord, we just pray for uh, this family that has had the wreck yesterday lord just take care of them and uh through this and we pray for the the missionaries lord uh that uh brother uh, jones as he's uh, battling this coronavirus lord just give him and his family lord i understand the whole family has it right now and especially him is in the worst condition just give them 
the healing that they need. And, and Lord, we, we pray for Jonesboro and, and all those uh, areas around there that were hit by the tornado, Lord. And just we pray for the churches there. I know that they're in pretty much the same situation we are with the, uh, the quarantines and all the things that are going on, but help the churches there to be able to help their town and their neighbors in a way that, that you are lifted up and brought honor and glory in, in all these things. Lord, we pray first and foremost, Lord, that, that your message is preached today, not only with us, but all the other preachers and all the other churches that are out there putting the word out on Facebook and YouTube and whatever media forms that they have, Lord, that your gospel will be proclaimed in a way that, uh, Lord, that it's uh, never seen before, that we'll see many souls saved out of this effort that we do, Lord, that, that you are lifted up and that you are honored and glorified, uh, just, uh, and, and that we don't get anything, but just we lift your name up, Lord, and that's what we desire. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, this morning we're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 18 through 25. And we're, we're going to finish up the series of being a peculiar people. Um, Peter is a- encouraging this church or these group of people that are scattered out all throughout different places. Encouraging them to continue on through the problems that they have and to continue on preaching and to be a peculiar people. And to be a people that is different. Different than the world, we uh, we are citizens of heaven, um, and that is uh, requires us to be different than the world. And today we're looking at submit to suffering. And when we think about suffering, that is, uh, I don't like suffering. If there's a way for me to avoid suffering, I try to go that route. Um, but as we look at what it takes to be a, as a not necessarily what it takes to be a Christian, but as you've become a Christian, if you are a Christian, it's going to happen. There's going to be suffering. And and here's the crazy thing about suffering. It's not even limited to people that are Christians. Everybody suffers. But as a child of God, uh, we're going to suffer for different reasons. We're going to be people that are persecuted. We're going to be people that are hated. We're going to go through some hard times like right now that's hard times and and like the people in Jonesboro. Not only are they being quarantined and they're having to stay away and there's a scare of the virus, but they're also dealing with losses of houses, loss of businesses, loss of all kinds of things because of this storm. And, And oftentimes we think, well, God, how could you do this? Well, the truth of the matter is, God is God and He knows what's best. And when we think about the suffering that we go through, we're a little bit selfish. As we sit and think, God allowed His Son to suffer. And He's calling us to be His servant. How do we not expect to suffer? And at what point... Are we better than Christ? And as we think about Christ and understand who Jesus is, Jesus is God in flesh. He lived perfect. And when I say perfect, I don't mean complete. I mean He didn't do anything wrong. He did everything that His Father told Him to do. He did everything that God planned uh, to happen. Everything Jesus did was for the purpose of the honor and the glory of the Father. And when He went to the cross and when He was being um, beaten and tried unjustly, He submitted. And as a child of God, we need to be people that are willing to submit to suffering without complaining, without griping, without without any kind of murmuring, and just be submissive to it and, and, and allow God to carry us through the suffering. Not only allow God to carry us through it, but rejoice as we're going through it. Now, that's a crazy thing to think about, but that is what's going to make us peculiar people whenever we submit with rejoicing through the suffering. And so as we read in our text, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 18 through 25, he says, Servants, be subject to your masters 
with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. For this is thankworthy. If a man for conscience towards God endure grief, suffering wrong and uh, grief and suffering wrongfully, for what glory is it when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently. But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we that ye uh, should follow his steps. Who did not who did no sin, neither was guile, guile found in his mouth. Who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed committed himself committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self uh, bear our sins in his own body on the on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes we ye were healed, for ye were um, as sheep going astray, but now returned into the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Christians should endure unjust treatment because Christ endured unjustly in order to return us to God. And we think about this, this was the theme of what, what Paul is, or Peter is writing here. We should endure the, this unjust treatment. And as we look at what we have here, there's, there's some things that we need to submit to. And there's four things that we need to do in our submission. The first thing that we need to do is we need to submit to our masters. And you think about masters, and especially in the time when Peter's writing, uh, in his, last week he was writing about the authorities, uh, submitting to the governors, submitting to the king, submitting to the presidents, submitting to whatever authority there is out there. Now he's dealing with the issue of, um, of the people that you work for. Uh, many of these people in this time frame, especially as you look at the time frame of when the Bible was being written, there was a lot of slavery. In fact, if you go into some of the Roman citizens and Roman uh, cities and those places, they would have been very likely to the point where there were more slaves than there were free people. And in those situations, those people that were being uh, becoming Christians... Nowhere do we find in the Bible that he was encouraging them to leave slavery. But instead of encouraging them to leave their slavery, rebelling against their masters, he encourages them to be good servants. For Americans, that's hard for us to imagine, especially in America where we have fought for freedom, uh, where so many people have fought to have freedom from slavery. And, and I thank God that there is no legal form of slavery in America. I think it's a great thing for America to, to uh, hate the, that people had to lose their life for this, but I'm glad that people are, we have freedom. But as a child of God, especially as Americans and as those of us in the, in the culture that we live in today, we don't necessarily have the idea of somebody owns me. But we do, most of you, you go to work tomorrow, or if whenever this stuff happens, you're going to answer to somebody. Very few people um, are the employees or employers, and so you're going to answer to someone. So submit to them. And now, as we look at what he says, and as he talks about it in the very first part here, he says in verse 18, he says, "Be subject to your masters with all fear." That fear is not so much as being trembling and scaring, but it's a respect and, and showing a respect not so much even to them, but there's a higher person that we are to respect, and that's God. Everything that we should do in life is the reason that we are to even be a peculiar people is because of our love and our respect and our fear for God. And the reason that we're going to submit to the suffering and submit to our masters is because of our love for God. That makes the difference in everything that we do. You say, I can't be a good, I just can't submit to somebody. If you're a child of God, yes, you can. Uh, first of all, because you know how good he is, and you're, as that love of Christ is coming into your life, it should be making a difference in your life. 
I know that all of a sudden you're not just going to all of a sudden just become this lovey-dovey person where every, everybody, you just love everybody. It's a part of the process. We begin to learn more about Jesus. And the more that we learn about Jesus, the more we're going to love other people. And in this situation where he's looking here, he says, he, 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 you know, in our mindset, whenever we say be good to the masters, be submissive to the masters, okay, so if my master is a Christian and he does things right, I'm going to be submissive to him. But notice the last part of verse 18, it says, be submissive to those, not only to the good and the gentle, but also to the forward. Uh, and, and the way that I would say that in Kentucky is, be good to the jerk boss. Um, the guy that's always on your case, the guy that's always just, it's hard to get along with. Be submissive to that guy or that lady, whoever it may be. As a Christian, that is, that is what makes us, that is, this is one area where we will stand out from the rest of the world. Not only are we to be submissive to those people, we are to be, and, and, and as we think about this word submissive and what we're supposed to do, as you go on in verse 19, it talks about being thankworthy. Uh, being submissive, this thankworthy, is, it doesn't have the idea, or not carrying the idea that we're worthy of being thanked by God. Folks, let's just be honest here. God doesn't owe any of us a thank you. We owe Him thank you, worship, thankfulness, just everything. But what this thankworthy means is as an attitude that is acceptable to God. Being submissive to, the, to your boss, being submissive to the people that you work for, even if you are a person that's self-employed, you have clients that you work or people that you have as customers, and you're to be even good to those people. You're to be in a business form and a person in business that whenever you do business, people can trust you and know you and know that there's something different about you, and it's not just good business. It's being a good citizen of the kingdom of God. And as we see what's going on, this is the acceptable. When I think about when Paul wrote in Romans, he says in, in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, and I'm not going to quote all of that because I'll mess it all up, but he talks about being a living sacrifice, and this is the reasonable service that you have for God. And that living sacrifice and the reasonable service that we have is just simply living a life that is in compliance with God and submitting to the authorities or the people that we work for, being a good citizen, being a good uh, person that takes care of his employees, being a person that takes care of his customers. That is the way that we are supposed to do these things, being thankworthy. And, and, and as it talks about that conscience towards God, it, we oftentimes people have this attitude that, they, that they're suffering, that somehow or another... Um, how, how dare God allow me to do this? Or how dare God put me through this? Maybe we should have this attitude of God's placed me in this situation to where I give Him honor and glory. There's times whenever you look at the life of Christ as you look through uh, the ministry of Christ, you can almost see that in, in whenever He goes and uh, they, they've sent word that Lazarus is sick. And Jesus tells his disciples, we're going to stay here a little while. And you're going to see the glory of God. And so for four, he waited, I don't know exactly the days, but by the time he got to Lazarus' house, Lazarus has been dead for four days. And we know that Jesus could have just spoke whenever he got the word because Jesus know, knew what was going on before they got word to him. He could have just spoken Lazarus been healed. He did that before in another situation. But in that point where Martha came out and she says, you know, if you would have been here, my brother would be alive. And that point, it's almost as if she's saying, God or Jesus, you know, you had the power, but you didn't do anything. And sometimes in our situations, when we're, being, when we're suffering from a bad employee or our employer or somebody just not treating us right, we sometimes have this attitude of, God, how can you allow that to happen to me? And the truth of the matter is, uh, and this talks about the having a conscience towards God, we could be the type of people that we're not necessarily, um, uh, we, we put our faith in God and we understand that God's allowing this to happen in our life for His honor and His glory. 
And that needs to be the attitude that we have every day, that whatever I'm going through, God, you're going to get the glory out of this. And if that means me being a good employee, if that means me taking care of my customers, if that means that I'm going to uh, be spoken down to, mistreated, I'm going to bring you honor and glory no matter what because that's what you want from me. And so this suffering that I'm going through, it's tough. Um, it's not something that I may be able to handle on my own, but you will give me the strength to get through and you're going to get the honor and glory out of it no matter what. And so as we see here, he says, submit to your masters. But he also talks about to be to submit patiently. I mean, think about submitting. It's not, one, it's not submitting if you're griping about it. It, it. Submission is not complaining about what's going through. And you think about the Pharisees and the things that they did whenever they were fasting. Uh, if you remember Jesus talking about the Pharisees when they were fasting, that they would make themselves look terrible so everybody would know how they are suffering for God. And Jesus says, get up and don't tell anybody that you're fasting. Get up, wash your face, uh, take a bath, get ready to go, and just go and you live. And your fasting and your suffering that you're going to have, guess what? It's going to be between me and you. And so as we think about suffering, the problems that we have, we need to do it patiently. Um, suffering, and as he gives an example here, he talks about if you're uh, in verse uh, 20, he says, and I'm just going to put it in, in, in my way of speaking, if you're suffering because you've done something that was a sin, you've done something stupid, that doesn't bring glory to God. Um, and I, I, I heard a man one time ask me, he said, I thought my sins were forgiven. And the truth of the matter is, your sins have been, once you put your faith in Jesus Christ, all your sins have been wiped away. Now, in the understanding of being wiped away, and the understanding that there will be no wrath, there's a difference between wrath and discipline. Um, the wrath of God is hell. And those that reject Jesus and those who reject the sacrifice that he made upon the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, they are going to suffer the wrath of God. They are going to enter into hell. And in one of these days, they're going to stand in front of Jesus. They're going to answer to Jesus and they're going to be cast into the, the, the lake of fire. That is the wrath of God. But those of us that are a child of God, we, can, we need to understand that there is the disciplining hand of God. Jesus is uh, the Son of God, and God the Father is going to discipline us with the pur same purpose that any good father would raise their child. They discipline their child so that that child will grow up and make good decisions, that they will uh, be profitable, that they will be uh, able to take care of themselves one day. In our situation, we are representatives of God and bringing glory to God. So the discipline that we go through for the stupid things that we do or disobedience that we do, there's no glory in that. But either way, sit down, hush your mouth, and take it. And so as we go on, but he, as he talks about that, but he talks about suffering, what Peter's really talking about in his, this area as he takes about that disclaimer about suffering for your sin what he brings out is suffering for something that you did right. So if you're being obedient to God, you're reading your Bible, you're praying, you're sharing the gospel with people, you're helping your neighbor, and you still have problems. Join the club. Everybody else has that. And, and as we go through that, we need to do it patiently. And don't sit there and gripe and complain. I've been doing, God, I've been doing this and this and I've done all these things and I'm still suffering. Folks, go through it. Endure the patience and accept the sacrifice that God is putting you through. Accept the trials that God is helping you through. One of the things I think about when I think about the book of James, James says that, that God is not going to tempt us to do evil. But he will allow us to go through some trials that help to train us and to make us better and to test us, to remove the impurities in our life. And as we are going through suffering, we need to do it patiently. Because as we put a smile on our face and we praise God through our struggles, even when the boss is, is on our case and we've done everything that we're supposed to do and he still rats us out and he still chews on us and he's still uh, being just a horrible boss we can still smile and praise Jesus because I'm still God's child. 
And the only way that I'm going to reach that guy, and here's the thing that you're going to find, there's a lot of times that that boss has got a problem himself or herself, whatever the, the case may be. And the only way that you're going to bring honor and glory to, and, to God in front of them is to smile and to be obedient to them and endure through those, patient, through those problems. But not only are we supposed to be uh, submit to our masters and submit patiently, we are to submit to the example that Christ gave. We are to submit to Christ's example. And man, everything goes back to Jesus. You could probably just take these verses and just preach these verses. And because these verses are, are they're just powerful. When you think about Christ, the example that he gave, as it talks about what he did, uh, and he gives a little example about Jesus. Jesus his example is, is, is not only was that when he went to the cross, not only did that pay for our sins, but it set a precedent. It set a standard for Christians to live to. When I say standard, no, you don't reach that standard and all of a sudden now you're saved. No, you're saved and now you are reaching for that standard. Jesus is the standard that we are reaching for and he is what we are to follow. So what he did on the cross, it saved us. He rose from the grave. That brought us out of, out of our sins and he's paid for our sins. But it's the example that we are to strive to go through. And as you think about it, it says that he had no sins and there was no guile in his mouth. Jesus didn't do anything wrong, and he didn't say anything wrong. There was no complaining. There was no griping. There was no slapping. There was none of these things. As it talks about, he did not revile back. When they were beating him, when they were uh, cursing him, when they uh, blindfolded him and they hit him and said, you know, tell us, if you would be the prophet, if you're this great, wonderful king, if you're this prophet, tell us who hit you. And they were mocking him and spitting on him and, and just doing all kinds of horrible things. And he never did anything back. As you think about the time whenever Pilate, uh, he tells Jesus, he said, if you knew who I, uh, you know, you need to give an answer or something because don't you know I have the power to set you free. The only thing that Jesus said to him was, uh, you only have the power that's given you. And, and Jesus is the one that had the power, and, he, and we can even read in the scriptures talk about if it was God's will, if, if Jesus wanted to come off of that cross, God would have sent 10,000 angels, and he would have wiped them away. And if Jesus wanted to come from that cross, if we understand who Jesus is, all he would have had to do is say, uh, this is it, I'm tired of it. And he could have walked off that cross, he could have spoke, and everybody would have been annihilated. But what we find is he did not revile back. He did not threaten. Can you imagine that? He never even threatened those guys. But as we think about the words on the cross, he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And you can just imagine how that registered with the people that were listening. Most of the people that you see, uh, that you would have seen on the cross we're cursing. You think about the other two, the the other two thieves that were crucified with Jesus. They were cursing and they were mad and they were angry and they were just bitter. But here's Jesus. In all of the agony and the wrath of God being placed upon him, not to mention all the things that the Romans were doing, the people spitting at him. And you can imagine this: the thousands of people, or millions of people, however many people there was that were calling for him to be crucified, many of those people ate from, from the food that Jesus supplied. Many of those people had to have been healed by Jesus. They had been, uh, suffered and Jesus helped them. And there they are cursing and spitting and stomping and throwing and gnashing their teeth at Jesus. And yet he never once said, How dare you? How dare you? I, I cast demons out of you. I fed you. I did this. He never did that. But yet he prayed for forgiveness. Yet he, he, he submitted his hands. And you think about whenever Jesus, when they came to, to get Jesus, he went willfully. And we don't have necessarily an account whenever they nailed his hands to the cross. But they didn't have to fight him. He willingly submitted to the cross. He willingly submitted to the beatings. He willingly submitted to all these things. If you remember, Jesus prayed three times. God, if there's, Father, if there's any other way for us to take care of this, let this cup pass from me. But instead of doing that, he says, 
not my will, but your will. Talking to his father. And then you see, it says that he took our sin. He took our death. And with his stripes we're healed and he made us righteous. Think about that for a second. He set the example. And we need to submit to the example. And the last point we got here this, this, this morning. Submit to revealing God's grace in your suffering. How will the world today, how will they see the suffering of Christ? I've never seen Jesus. I've never been to Israel. I've never seen the tomb. I've never seen a crucifixion. In fact, I've never seen any kind of uh, execution. And much less the way that Christ died. So how did I know the suffering of Christ? How did you know the suffering of Christ? You saw it in somebody else. You saw someone give up their time to teach a Sunday school class. You saw someone take off a week of work to go to a church camp and teach. Or just be there to listen to you um, and the problems that you had. You saw someone leave the field that they had or the, and they had cows to milk and they left to go take care of, uh, to do things with church. Uh, you, you saw someone give when they didn't have much to give. You saw someone do something different. You, can you imagine? Here's one of the things that, that just as a pastor and I, I go to see people that are suffering, they're, uh, they're, they're on their deathbed, and I leave rejoicing because those people even in their suffering, they're doing it and they're showing the grace of God. So how will the world see the suffering of Christ and what He did? They're going to see it in you. They're going to see it in me. I've been healed. I have been made righteous by the grace of God that was revealed from somebody else. There's not a person on this earth that is an eyewitness of Jesus' suffering. There's not a person on this earth that is an eyewitness of the resurrected Christ. There's not a person on this earth that, is even, that even knows anybody that has that experience. We rely upon other people showing and preaching the grace of God in their suffering. And revealing God's grace in your suffering can lead people to return to the shepherd. That last part of the verse 25, the last part of the chapter here. He says, Ye were as sheep gone astray. I'm going to let you know who that is. The people that are gone astray. That's everybody that has not put their faith in Jesus Christ. And some of those people go to church. Everybody that has not put their faith in Jesus Christ, they have gone astray. So whenever you see people out in the world and they're acting a fool, let me let you know who they are. They're a sheep that's gone astray. When you see people that are speaking ugly and they're, they just, they're just not nice folks, those are people that have gone astray. When that boss or that person that you work for or one of the people that you're a customer, that is one of your customers, however it may be, and they're just hard as they can be to get along with, look at them as a sheep that has gone astray. That's when you smile and you shake your head and you say, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, whatever it is. And you do your best to do a good job. And you thank God for that opportunity. Thank God for suffering. Thank God for being chewed out. Thank God for somebody that's hard to get along with. If you're doing God's will, thank God. Because in that moment, I like what it says, but are now returned unto the shepherd and the bishop of your soul. In those moments, 
I'll just give you my personal experience. I have, when I, before I was pastoring, I delivered milk to grocery stores and uh, dollar stores and gas stations and schools and prisons and everything else. And I, ever, it seems like every time I'd get there would be a new manager of a store, they would just, man, they were hard to get along with. And everybody was an idiot. And they were right on most of it. But what I found is if I was a good servant, many a times those managers or those folks working, after time, after I was submissive to whatever their demands were, even some of those that had ungodly lifestyles and they had a terrible mouth and they had a terrible attitude, there were times in their life when they would say, Hey, milkman, I need you to pray for me. Hey, uh, I've got this going on in my life. Me and my wife, or me and my husband, or me and my child, or we've got cancer, we've got this. And because I was a good servant, I had opportunities to share in a secular world I had opportunities to uh, love people and 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 did i complain yeah I, I i probably when i got back in the truck i complained and i griped about them just like terrible but evidently god gave me enough grace to to live right in their lives to the point whenever they had problems in their life they were looking for somewhere to go and I was the person that they thought of because there was something different in me than the rest of the people there. Now, understand, I saw these people about 15, 20 minutes a week. Think about the people that you work for. Think about the people that are around you. Think about the neighbor that's just not a good neighbor. Love them. Be kind to them. Be patient with them. Be peculiar. Be a people that whenever times get tough and whenever people get hurting, they're going to call you up and say, Hey, hey neighbor, hey whoever you are, I need prayer. You're different. You're different than anybody I've been around, and I need what you have. You see, that's whenever we give an answer for the grace of God. That's when we give an answer. Whenever we suffer through those things, we can say, I do this so that because I love you. I do this because you need Jesus. And I want you to know that Jesus' suffering was real. And because he suffered, I can too. And folks, I want you to understand that if you don't know Christ, that what Jesus did upon that cross, he did it for you. And what God, and not only did He do that for you, but the Father sent Him to do that for you. And the Holy Spirit is working still today trying to convince you and to draw you to understand what Jesus has done, what the Father had planned, and that you can be saved too if you will put your faith in what Jesus did and that He rose from the grave because He died for your sins. If you're struggling today, just trust Him. We've got um, three other guys in this room here. And if you want to contact us through Facebook Messenger or, or whatever in the comments, we'll figure out a way to talk to you. And we want you to understand that Jesus loves you. And we'll explain salvation to the best of our ability and, and what the Holy Spirit helps us with. Because we want you to know about the suffering of Christ so that you can understand the rest of God. Folks, we love you and we appreciate you. And we're going to sign off here and we're going to have a word of prayer. And we pray that each and every one of you, if you have any questions, give us a call, give us a, a text or a, a Facebook messenger, and we're going to do what we can to be a blessing to, first of all, our Lord and Savior, and then to you. Lord, we come to you at this time. And Lord, we thank you for the suffering that you had. And Lord, I pray that 
that I will not shy away from the suffering that you place in my life. That I will be faithful to serve you and to love you and, and to be content even in the suffering, even in the hard times, that I'll be content with it. And Lord, that, that I'll see these um, sufferings not as a burden, but as an opportunity to let your light shine in my life. Lord, I pray if there's anybody out here that has not put their faith in you, Lord, that they will just trust that that you are the perfect Son of God, that you lived this on this life on this earth, a perfect life, and you went to that cross perfect, and you rose from that grave, sinless, and our and to take away our sins. If anybody will put their faith in you, that you will save them. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys for joining us. We'll see you next week.